river itself has a long geological history. What you see now is only the last six and a half thousand years. And that's the time in which Aboriginal people have been moving up and down and living along this waterway. And in the last 200 odd years, it's changed enormously, as you can imagine. There were none of those high rises over there, for example. <laughs> but more importantly, there was very little mangrove along the river. It was nearly all salt marsh and freshwater reed swamp in the mouths of the main creek coming down. But the river itself, the previous 15,000 years or so, this was a dry valley. It was cut down into alluvial sediments, mud and sandy clay, the sort of stuff that's on the bottom of the river now. But it would have been a fairly deep valley because by the time you get down to the heads, the depth of the rock valley is 110 metres and the actual land where the river debouched into the sea, into the Tasman, back 15, 20,000 years ago, the coastline was 12 to 15 kilometres offshore from the heads. Now why was all of that? Because it's in the last ice age. The last ice age, the impact on Australia was to lower sea level, make the continent bigger, join Tasmania and Australia and join Papua New Guinea and Australia and eventually as the ice melted back and the sea level started to rise, came up very rapidly. Average rate of rise one metre a century and it's the sort of scale we're talking about at the moment for sea level rise attributed to global warming about one metre a century. In fact the coastal councils of New South Wales are working on that figure. But if it comes any higher than that and there is a possibility we're going to wipe out all of the real estate that you see around you at the present time. Now, of course, you know about the roads development, all the very expensive apartment blocks sitting on top of one of Sydney's most contaminated landfill sites. Most of that contamination, so far as the land side of it is concerned, was cleaned up with a couple of attempts, but knowing how these things operate, there'll still be hotspot contamination in there if you disturb the ground. But more importantly, the sediments underneath the keel are absolutely chock full of lead and zinc and organic carbons and so forth. And do you want to have a go at this? <laughs> No, sir, yeah, I'm just interested to know about all this silt here. And what's happened is, of course, we're on a very big run out tide at the moment. And because I've got all my uh, ballast, all my weight is up here sitting on my rudder, we're sitting in the dirt. Preferably if I can load the bow up. We've got to be here all day. Tides run right out, and because of all the weight on the stern there, that's the most part that's in the water, is on my propeller and rudder shaft. Here we go. A bit of movement, lift. Problem solved. Yeah. Put a weight up for it, lifted the back of it up, gave us a bit of steerage, yes. I don't know what my last word is, but I probably was saying something about the sediment in the bay, which it, it's absolutely chock full of very fine muds and those muds are full of heavy metals and dioxins and other organic pollutants. There's been a lot of discussion about what should we do about it. One of the options obviously would be to dredge it all, put it in barges and take it off somewhere offshore and dump it in an innocuous place if you can find such a thing. But the general message seems to be that that would cause so much disturbance in the water body and liberate so much of the pollutants that it would be pretty devastating for the rest of the harbour. So the policy at the moment, I mean this may change, is that it's to be left there. I think that one of the things they probably should think about is some sort of notification to mariners that uh, deep draft boats like ferries shouldn't <laughs> enter into Hobel's Bay. Back up on the Rhodes Peninsula, there was industrial development there at the turn of the uh, 20th century, which is contributing uh, heavy metal pollution for starters. And then it just got worse and worse as the chemical industries came in. But the pollution continues today, and it's both sediment coming from urban development and redevelopment, and stuff coming down the stormwater into the creeks and down into the harbour and one of the biggest components of that is actually zinc which comes from car tyres. I was commenting on the mangroves and their general encroachment right up through the harbour at the expense of salt marsh and freshwater reed swamp. The cause of that primarily is the amount of sediment that's come down out of the urban areas as they were developed. As we open up more and more land to housing and industry, clear the vegetation off it, and for that short period of a few years as it's all opened up, there's an awful lot of soil exposure. That soil gets washed down the creeks into the valley floor down here and is dumped at the mouth of the streams.
coming down into the village of Putney on the north bank and it's the first time we actually see a beach just in this area here. It's beaches that are being formed at the expense of the edge of the mangroves and those grasslands as they're fretted back by wave attack from the wakes or the boats coming up and down the stream. All of these areas of the sea walls, they're just at the level of high water mark today. And when you get a king tide in this system, they overtop and all of the bay heads from here on down have seawalls across the mouth of them and they've been backfilled usually with domestic rubbish to make sports fields. So we have hundreds of sports fields all sitting just above high water mark. They're already being encroached by salt water during king tides and if that figure for a projected sea level rise of one metre by the end of this century is at all real, they are going to be flooded and they will become salt marsh type environments. The other thing they don't know about is that the time it takes for the water body in the harbour to actually be flushed by tides can be as much as three or four months. The tides go up and down and the water goes backwards and forwards, but if you've got a load of pollutants in it at any time, it stays polluted until you get a big rainfall event that floods the whole system and washes it out to sea. So we really do need to take a lot more care with what goes into the river, not stir up those bottom muds and get it cleaner and cleaner. In the long term, I think I'm pretty optimistic. I see more and more people taking part in environmental type restoration activities. I like it, yeah, optimistic in the long term. Mm -hmm.